Hey folks, just me Sabora here. As I watched and reviewed The Craft last week, I want to review another witchcraft film for October. And I know I mentioned it a few times already, and that is The Witches of Eastwick, which is based on a novel by John Opdyke. It's a story about a mysterious, irresistible, sexy, and charming man, but deep down of it, he's the devil in disguise, who seduces three women who happen to be witches, all played by Cher, Susan Sarandon, and Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah. This is the DVD that I picked up a long time ago, like back in 2008, when he had this on sale at Kmart, which I know my Kmart's been closed down already. But they had a lot of great titles that they sold, considering that they didn't have much of a bigger selection until, well, you know. Um, there is a Blu-ray release, but it was double featured with Practical Magic with Sandra Bullock and Nicole Kidman. I like to track that one down someday to see the difference. But I actually would love to see a better Blu-ray release, either from Screen Factory, because it obviously needs one, or maybe Warner Brothers might take a chance out of it. But that would be cool if we had that. Otherwise, that's probably the only thing we can get. Uh, it does contain a trailer, production notes, and even the, the film's score. It, there's an option where you can actually listen to the score without the dialogue. Um, but it's bare bones. I wish there was a featurette and all this other stuff included, but that's all you can get for this release. But, hey, what can you do? And this was a movie I saw as a kid. Uh, I remember my family started renting this movie, and I think they rented this along with um, Inner Space, two of the most uh, summer movies to come out in 87. They were very successful at the time. And like both of these films, well, this is going to sound a little embarrassing, but you know what? That's okay. I was very young. They actually scared me. <laughs> they, they really did. But nowadays, if I watch it today, it won't scare me as much, but I would definitely appreciate the, the visual effects that they had at the time. Yeah, very incredible. And the way the story goes, and the way it flows. I mean, th this is definitely a, a fantasy comedy that we didn't expect it. But they had horror elements in there. So I'm going to start the review right now. Stars Jack Nicholson. You know, wonderful actor. He's been in a lot of great films, too, in his career. You know, like Five Easy Pieces, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, The Shining. Batman, uh, As Good As It Gets, yeah, those films. Cher, who I know she was in that uh, TV series uh, with her husband, Sonny Bono, yeah, Sonny and Cher, she's a singer herself too, but she had appeared in films like um, Sookwood with uh, Meryl Streep and Kurt Russell. And she went on to do movies like Suspect with Dennis Quaid, Joe Mantegna, and Liam Neeson. Same year as this movie. And, and of course, Moonstruck with Nicolas Cage, uh, Vincent Gardenia, Olivia Dukakis, and uh, Danny Aiello, covers the soul. Yeah. She's a great actress and a very talented singer. And she's pretty hot, too. <laughs> uh, Susan Sarandon. Yep. Marvelous actress. She was in films like The Rocky Horror Picture Show, as well as um, a film on Louise, Enchanted, uh, Speed Racer, uh, Dead Man Walking, All Come to Mind. 
love that actress too. Very sexy. Michelle Pfeiffer, of course. She was in Scarface, as well as um, Batman Returns, like Stardust, <laughs> uh, Dark Shadows, uh, the Tim Burton film, as well as uh, Frankie and Johnny with Al Pacino. Um, always been an excellent actress. Veronica Cartwright, a British actress. Been in several films and, and stuff. Bridget Jenkins, been in some great films. Keith uh, Jockchain, Becca Lish, and Carol uh, Strukan, who later went on to play Lurch in the Addams Family movies. Yeah, one and two. It's uh, written by Michael Christopher, uh, based upon the novel by John Updike, as I mentioned. And it's directed by George Miller, the same man, Australian director, who gave us the Mad Max films. The movie begins in a small town called Eastwick, Rhode Island. We meet free woman, Alexandra Medford, played by Cher, Jane Spotford, played by Susan Sarandon, and Suki Richmond, played by Michelle Pfeiffer. Um, fortunately, they lost all their husbands at their age. Um, Alex is a sculptor and a widower of a single mother of one daughter. Jane is uh, a newly divorced uh, music teacher but was unable to have children of her own. And Suki has six children and works as a columnist at the Eastwood Word newspaper. Um, so, of course, they turn out to be witches. So they were all together, you know, form a coven where they had their weekly get-togethers and share their fantasies about ideal men. And they were hoping that they're going to find the perfect Mr. Right that they had to create. And that's where we spotted a mysterious man, which has already been revealed by the townspeople later on. Daryl Van Horn, who was played by Jack Nicholson. He was a, a very irresistible kind of guy, but deep down of it, yes, he's the devil. But he arrives in town, stirs up a lot of trouble by buying the town's landmark property, the Lennox Mansion, joined by his butler, uh, Fidel, who was played by Carol Strickham. So, that's where they, they all met him and Felicia Alden, played by Veronica Carwright, who happens to be a debordedly a religious woman and the wife of a newspaper editor, Clyde Alden, who is played by Richard Jenkins, who happens to be Suki's boss. Uh, when Felicia senses the man, reveals the name, all of a sudden Suki's uh, necklace of brace starts to come out, and Felicia trips, fell all the way down into a flight of stairs, and broke her leg. And now she was sentenced to a hospital. Yeah, so that's how chaos starts to spread around the world during town. Um, but the following day, uh, Daryl had sets out for a seduction, starting with Alex, as he converts with her, saying all these insensitive, disgusting, and rude things around her while having lunch. And then next thing you know, she became appalled and tells him off, you know, while he was lying in bed, you know, wearing his uh, robe, trying to look almost as charming as he could be. Um, so therefore, yeah, he starts to talk dirty and was ready to, you know, get attached to her, and then she suddenly falls in love with him. Then the next, um, 
he begins to seduce uh, Jane. As we all know, she actually plays the cello on her own. She's very shy and um, insecure. So they they two sat down, share a polite uh, conversation. Jane explains that the Lennox Mansion was built on the site where the witches had been burned to the stake. Uh, therefore, Daryl encourages Jane to play her cello with a wild abandon, yet becoming more sexier this way and, and steamy hot. <laughs> yeah, because um, she accidentally uh, hurt her finger while playing the cello and broke in one of the strings. So, of course, Daryl had brought in a new cello so he'll be able to play as hot as she can as harder as she can while Daryl is playing on the piano to that tune and that's where she starts falling in love with Daryl. As the cello catches on fire she actually flings herself with him. Then we finally get to Suki. So now this is going to be the last seduction from Daryl. When they were going around at the mansion, they were playing tennis, and it libertates. <laughs> so, yeah, you see the ball going up in the air, and sometimes it just goes, stops right in the middle, in midair, and and then it just <laughs> they just going around playing the game. <laughs> it, it was like crazy. And by the time. Uh, they hit the ball and they go all the way up in the air in the sky. That's when the rain pours down with a thunderstorm and yeah, you can see them in slow motion, all three of the girls just running around together. I thought that was really cool. So at that point on, I mean with passion, they they actually um, went to the pool. That's, of course, where Daryl seduces uh, Suki. And then next thing you know, uh, they just hang around. They're joined by the children, too, by, you know, playing on, on the pink balloons. Um, Daryl certainly films um, Alex, as well as um, Jane and Suki, you know, talking about uh, their problems and other stuff, too. You know, all their confessions that they had. And, and then later, um, well, they're playing some more seductive games and everything. Such as having Jane, you know, flying off uh, from the carts and hanging on to the chandelier and, and swings around. And then next thing you know, all three girls started floating. Yep, Daryl was just using their powers. To actually float around in the swimming pool. And yeah, they're just having fun. Exactly what Daryl wants in his life. You know, he doesn't want to feel completely lonely. But then, as a woman spends more time at Daryl's mansion, that's when Felicia spreads so many rumors going around town while she was in the hospital and she actually recovers. From her um, broken leg, she started talking uh, very funny, too. And then at that point on, especially at church, you know, she started to explain about what's going on. She's not exactly herself, and, and it, to make matters worse, um, she started vomiting all these cherries. Which at that point on, Daryl was the one who possesses uh, Felicia. They thought maybe it was the girls that did that to her, but it wasn't. Yeah, she started vomiting, all of that, until Clyde just uh, pretty much killed her because he had no choice. She was, she was going to get much worse. So now they found out that Felicia was dead. All three of them were shocked. Uh, they were... They thought that they weren't, they knew that they didn't do anything to her, but they felt like, I don't know, maybe they, they thought they did do something to her, but they didn't. So 
So they argue with each other until the pavement starts to rumble. And therefore, um, they decided to make a decision by not seeing Daryl again because it's going to make matters worse. After they've spotted some rumors and gossip that's coming from the newspaper that they sent. Yeah. Well, at that point on, Daryl started feeling increasingly. Um, by that point on, Daryl started to feel incredibly lonely, very upset, frustratingly mad that he's trying to do what he can to actually make it up for these girls and hoping that things will get better. But unfortunately, it started to get worse because that's where he starts to possess uh, his powers to them by scaring uh, Alex with a, uh, a plague of snakes at her home and then uh, Jane started to become a lot older aging uh, rapidly and then Suki wants up in pain then she ends up in the hospital and then we learned that yes they're pregnant hard to believe so to get their revenge on Daryl well Daryl decided to they form a plan by actually going back to Daryl's mansion just to hang around do exactly what he says to make up for all the problems that that happened but this was a trick as uh, the following morning all three of them had asked Daryl to go get some bagels and some ice cream, maybe some other stuff to go with it, joined by uh, Fidel, the butler, to drive around. But then Alex, Jane, and Zuki had created a voodoo doll for Daryl, you know, using candle wax and all this other stuff. And he actually uses the needle pins, and then they have to use the cherries to make him go completely nuts and under control. Like, at this rate, when he's under this, this spell, that they actually uh, perform, you know, witchcraft. That's where he starts to go under control by, by crashing into the ice cream. Yeah, the chocolate ice cream, and then, yeah, you grab two uh, gallons but then under that spell he, you know he, he just couldn't stop controlling it you know they, they put a lot of fetters on him and then all the fetters go and you know, he started puffing all these fetters right through his mouth and and then there's like a huge wind that's blowing him off all the way straight into the church and that's where he creates this this incredible speech talking about that woman as God created woman <laughs> becomes the mistake and then he goes around vomiting right in front of uh, the church uh, crowds yeah vomiting all that cherry and continues vomiting too and then afterwards he started to go rush uh, in inside the, the car which left uh, Fidel behind and he started driving all the way while he's already you know getting completely nuts already in control with the Budu Dao um, already crashing in here and there and now when he finally made it to the mansion he's about to get revenge on three of them of course <laughs> Already the dog was like sniffing the, the voodoo doll. They try to hide it. They're trying to clean everything up. They're trying to make it look like they didn't do anything to him. But actually <laughs> they did. And now that's how he becomes basically a demon. A giant demon. You know, after the, the voodoo doll had, had broken into pieces, they try to put them together, but 
he was already transforming into this giant demon until uh, he, he actually started rumbling the entire mansion and now finally he disappears as like a small uh, nymph type so 18 months later the women are living together in Daryl's mansion and they admit that they miss him but each of them had a new baby son all sharing their mother's hair color so the boys were playing together when suddenly Daryl appears on the wall filled with video screens yeah all uh, nine TVs the same TVs that, that was shown the, when they show uh, the videos of, of the confessions of the, the witches and they're just telling them to give daddy a kiss you know invites them and before they could do so well Alex Jane and Suki appears and switch off the TV set and the movie ends this way <laughs> um, very fascinating uh, well made uh, story I haven't read the novel so I can't say I, I sense they had some different changes around that they had to do but for whatever they, they took I thought they really uh, did an impressive job um, now, I, I was told that originally they were going to get Bill Murray to play the role of uh, Daryl, and I thought, wow, that could have been interesting, but otherwise, I think Nicholson was, was better off, because he nailed that performance. Um, mostly because uh, Angelica Houston was going to be cast as Alex, um, which, that would have been ironic, though, because... Angelica Houston went on to play the head witch in The Witches from 1990 based on the Roald Dahl book by the way we are getting a remake of that so that's going to air it on HBO Max with Anne Hathaway I'm not so sure about that one because I did enjoy the 1990 better they had better special effects too um, I guess things were not working out, as it seems. Um, they were also going to get Amy Madigan to play the part of Jane. And Michelle Pfeiffer was um, already cast. So they were hoping that, you know, they were going to work well. But the way the screen tested it didn't go as smooth as possible. They hired Cher and Susan Sarandon. And they nailed it perfectly, too. I mean, they were definitely the right choices to play the part of of the, the witches themselves. I could see that too, because I know both Cher and, and, and Susan Sarandon are both uh, very um, sexy and seductive actresses that they could really nail this. Michelle Pfeiffer, you know, quite young at that age, so she was in her 20s, uh, late 20s, I believe, um, almost hitting 30. Uh, yeah, they were they were perfect, and I'm glad they they got the right choice. Because I thought Jack Nicholson was incredibly creepy when I saw his performance. It's like now I can see why he was cast to play Jack Napier, the gangster, aka Joker, in the Batman. I bet maybe Tim Burton must have saw his performance, unless he saw The Shining. <laughs> Because, I swear to God, every time I see Jack Nicholson on screen when it comes to these movies, he scares me. I'm not kidding, he does scare me. Every time I see him in these creepy roles, you know, where he's always uh, so loud, crazy, that devilish smile that he has on his face. I mean, I mean you can see by the tip of his eyebrows. And he laughs too. Oh man. I mean, he's charming, but it's like, geez, do I want to get near this guy? <laughs> but nevertheless, he's, he's also cool. Again, with the, the main ladies, you know, Cher, Susan Sarandon, and Michelle Pfeiffer, they were terrific. They were magnificent together. They had terrific chemistry right there as the witches. You definitely care for them after going through tough times. 
you know, they lost their husbands and they're hoping to find the perfect man for their job and hoping they'll be able to have babies too. And then things will be, you know, exactly what it seems. I love the fact that this movie does have a fascinating connection with the actors themselves too. And here's an example. Uh, Jack Nicholson along with Michelle Pfeiffer and Richard Jenkins would later appear in another uh, fantasy horror film called Wolf, which Jack Nicholson plays a werewolf yeah, after he got bitten by a wolf. But he's a businessman that, that's struggling a lot. Uh, I know Susan Sarandon would, well, according to her performance in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which I know got her start in her entire career, she would later went on to play the Wicked Queen and an old hag, which the makeup job was done by Rick Baker, by the way. I forgot to mention that when I did my review of the movie Enchanted. Yeah, the one with Amy Adams, Patrick Dempsey, Timothy Spall, James Marsden. Yeah. Awesome movie. It became my favorite uh, Amy Adams film, <laughs> of course. Michelle Pfeiffer would later went on to play a witch in Stardust, the film with Robert De Niro, as well as Charlie Cox and Claire Danes, among others. Uh, what else? I think um, I think Veronica Cartwright might have been in some other different um, films too that I'm not so sure if she ever had done a a horror film. I think she might have. I don't know. I, I could, could be wrong. But either way um, it did have a nice connection right there. As for the, the location though I thought it looks um, exactly what a small town looks like. Um, I know they shot this um, at different uh, locations here like Half of the movie set uh, from the mansion was actually shot at uh, Warner Brothers uh, Studio Lot in Burbank, California, which is impressive. And I know they were going to shoot this originally in Little Compton, Rhode Island, exactly as the book suggested it, but because during that controversy that erupted, whatever or not that. Uh, the Congressional Church should be involved, well, because they deal with religious matter here. They didn't seem to work out very well, so they had to choose uh, all the Massachusetts um, locations before they get the right um, shot here. So that way they make it look like it was Rhode Island. They did what they could. And, um, and they also used all the wooden signs and all this other stuff too that they built. So it was perfect. Um, as for the special effects, though, it was all done by Industrial Light and Magic. They did an incredible job, you know, with all these uh, wonderful effects that gives it a creepy uh, vibe to it. Especially the film's climax, too, as I already mentioned. I mean, where Daryl becomes a, der a demon, a giant demon. I mean, I, that's where I started to run away. <laughs> Every time I see that scene, I, I was ready to run as fast as I can because it scares the hell out of me. And I, I remember my brother, Jason, was trying to tell me something like, what did I miss? What did I miss? It's like, I didn't want to see that scene. <laughs> God, I was such a wimp. But whatever. <laughs> uh, the, it had a haunting score by John Williams. Yeah, the same man who did the theme for Star Wars. And of course, Jurassic Park. Um, it was done incredibly, uh, insanely um, creepy and all, and it worked. Uh, it, it was very wonderful, very uh, arousing at times. And I can see why we had the score on the DVD, <laughs> so you get to listen to that. You can also get the soundtrack to. Unless you could try to find it, because sometimes, you know, they're pretty rare. Uh, 
anyway, um, the movie was also nominated for Academy Awards too, uh, mostly for the original score and the sound. They had uh, nominated for Best Special Effects for other awards like Hugo. Yeah, they, it did win a BAFTA award. Um, I know Jack Nicholson actually won uh, a few awards. Like he won the, like he won the Los Angeles Film Critics Association, as well as New York Film Critics Circle and Saturn Awards. Um, but yeah, the BAFTA Awards, yeah, they won for special visual effects. And I was like, wow. <laughs> Of course, I, I do wish it had won for the awards, but I, I understand. Uh, but therefore, um, I, I love the story that it turns out. The story was actually fascinating, once again. And George Miller's direction really nailed it, too. I mean, this is the first time he ever got to do a fantasy uh, dark comedy with horror elements in there. A supernatural in the mix. I mean, after his um, direction with the, one of the segments of the Twilight Zone, the movie, it proves that he can actually do something like this. Because he was mostly doing the Mad Max films. Yeah. So he had some natural talent right there. Also, you got producers uh, Peter Goober and John Peters, which I know they later went on to produce the Batman movies. Uh, Neil Canton, of course, who was the head of uh, Warner Bros. at the time, would produce and films and all. Um, the cinematography was outstanding, done by uh, Bilmo's uh, Zygmunt. And uh, it was a big hit at the time. I mean, for its $22 million budget, it only made $63.8 million in North America. So it didn't so this was perfect and of course uh, joined by other summer films to come out like Predator, uh, Spaceballs, uh, Inner Space uh, and then later Robocop and all this this pretty much shows the perfect um, summer right there um, and I, I also love the parts of the film too where I'll say this, my favorite scene had to be the the levitation, the tennis scene, you know, where the ball just goes up, it stops, and there's even a moment where <laughs> Zuki actually uh, hits the ball in her ass, and then both Zuki and, and Daryl just hitting the ball as fast as they can, or, <laughs> or they try to serve too, and, and they were also serving all the way. <laughs> <laughs> and they hit. They continue to hit while, while uh, Jane was t tying her shoes. So you know, uh, that was just crazy. Again, and um, that crazy, uh, insanely scene. You know where Felicia you know, already uh, possessed you know, by Daryl's spell and. Already, she was doing that seductive uh, dance move, and then she started vomiting all that cherries after feeding all the cherries at the girls. Uh, boy, <laughs> crazy! I also love the moment too, where at the elementary school during music class, uh, Jane started to teach uh, the kids how to play without using all the. Uh, the musical notes, so they had to throw that away and start to play exactly as powerful as they could be. So, it, pretty much under the control of her powers. And that's where, you know, the, the principal was, or anybody, were just incredibly shocked. But that, that was really cool. Or, uh, any of the other, um, particular um, awesome scenes that they've got in the film. I know, I mean, I, there's more to talk about, but I, I just want to keep it that way. So, definitely check this movie out. I mean, it's great. It's the perfect movie for, for any uh, witchcraft or fantasy horror films or any other 
Trish in October. So that's The Witches of Eastwick, and I give the movie five stars. I'm Josephine Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.